the reason I wanted to finish at least the last section of chapter five was primarily it kind of stages us for a 2D slash 3D rendering concept. Uh, and it was the contours it, at the very end of chapter five, we were talking about plotting a, a 2D image of a 3D data plot. And so your contours package is actually where this comes in. I thought that it was a great bridge that takes us into chapter six. So I will, uh, I'll see what we can get uh, accomplished with the rest of this chapter five and we'll pick up from there. Uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my primary screen. Okay, and hit share. So now everyone gets to see uh, the Chrome version of the R Markdown slide deck. So just briefly, I want to reiterate our learning objectives for this chapter five. This was all about statistical summaries and the relation between X and Y and how they correlate with each other or visualize with each other. Using the ggplot2 uh, possible uncertainty, use ggplot2 to plot possible uncertainties in your data and then determine which geometric object or geome best presents your type of data. How do you work with all these various types of geomes? At the very end of this chapter, you're going to start to witness, we're going to uh, use freak poly and some other uh, derivatives to plot some of our media. I had left off, I believe it was with the distributions, yes. We had the uh, diamonds data set as our focus of attention for this uh, uh, section of the, the document, chapter five. And I threw in this image here to represent the measurements that we have in the diamonds data set. This is not an R uh, plotted uh, thumbnail. It's actually uh, pulled from the uh, images of, of the uh, ggplot2 book. But I thought it was helpful to understand or correlate the XY coordinates and how these measurements are applied in our next plotting sequences. So I initially had shown the uh, one dimensional plot of just a histogram. Um, keeping in mind that the aesthetic uh, that we're using is the depth, okay, and if we go back to the top, depth is actually the z-coordinate or the height of the diamond, the depth of the diamond, how much of the uh, diamond is there. And so by plotting the histogram, uh, we were using a, a stat bin uh, equal 30. Uh, you, can, you can change this bin width, uh, what we'll see here in just a second, is by changing the bin width, uh, you're going to be able to see a greater plotting of this and the data will make more sense. So this first initial histogram or, or, or uh, uh, what's that word called, bell curve uh, of plotted data, it looks like the, uh, the average is about at that 63 to maybe 64 uh, pointed area. And I don't know what that unit of measurement is, 50, 60, 70, um, what that depth uh, is, is it millimeters or, or centimeters? I wouldn't think it would be that large. Um, the next plotted point we have is going to again use the diamonds data set and we're using the aesthetic of depth, but now we're going to add a bin width to this measurement. The bin width is uh, the amount of space in between each line uh, as it's drawn. Um, just as a quick correlation, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole with my own studies of bin widths and exactly what they were trying to, to correlate with. In calculus, if you imagine that math is in motion and you have a particular curve, the measurement or slicing of each one of those points stacked together is going to fill in that curve. And that's, it's one of the uh, formulas of, of that uh, uh, calc uh, form. Lydia, that's, I'm going with you on that, uh, going back to my earlier comment of comprehending exactly what's going on here. So we're, we're using a bin width, bin width of 0.1, and then we're also applying a X limit. So again, if you think of your X coordinate system horizontally across the bottom of your scale, and then by measuring it as 0.1, what you end up getting is this really uh, uh, sliced version that allows more plotted points than the previous, which was just grouping them together as one large group. Uh, do you understand what I'm referring to here between these two types of graphs? This one doesn't really give you much depth or, or, or comprehension of, of what you're plotting on the, on the uh, screen. However, if we add that bin width, 
now we can see that there's a lot more samples that we're measuring and everything starts to make a little bit more sense uh, of how that uh, measurement comes out. Anybody want to add to that statement? Uh, our author of this book puts a lot of emphasis on uh, being able to apply the bin width uh, measurement whenever you're uh, trying to visualize or understand the intricacies of your data set by changing that bin width, you're grouping or ungrouping things, making it uh, a little bit more finite. Um, I like to think of, of kind of a scaling system where you're at 60,000 foot looking at the entire forest and then you zoom into a couple of feet off the ground and you're looking at the bark of a tree. So your scale or your measurement, the, the uh, I don't wanna say sample size, but your, your, how focused in on the data are you making it? That's what that bin width is allowing us to do. Um, Kent, if you don't mind me uh, interrupting or, or asking you particularly, um, when we reference the term bin, that sliver of information, I tried to scale or change it in, in different nuances of this output just to see kind of the relationship. Is there a good rule of thumb? The textbook doesn't tell us what measurement to use. We just kind of throw an arbitrary number out there. Uh, do you have any, any relation with... Um, maybe a common size stand if you ever use this as well? I think it really depends on your data. Um, generally, you know, if you're familiar with the data, you might have some idea what kind of granularity you want. Um, and also just e experimenting really is very helpful. If you get too granular, you'll tend to get very jagged peaks because you'll have bins that have missing data or bins with a lot, with a lot of data. Yeah. So that's, um, your bins are too small. Um, it really, it depends a lot on, I think, on what you're trying to see. Okay. Um, you know, this is a visualization and like all visualizations, I guess, depends on what you're trying to do, but yeah. uh, tend to make it finer until I can see what I wanna see and then stop. Well, I was thinking like if you if you're plotting you know a variable in this case it's depth if you're plotting the bin va uh, factors could it just be the mean value of all of the data and that's where you start and then measure off of that point um, I was thinking of like a formulative way to look at a complete variable right what is the average value of that uh, uh, set and then use that as a bin width increasing or decreasing the slicing. I'll show in a moment, uh, I went a little bit too crazy on my uh, bin widths. There's a point where it gets too jagged. Uh, I think it's in one of the exercise questions, but I was trying to figure out a way mathematically that I could apply a bin width with confidence, knowing that I'm sampling it correctly and then change the, uh, change the uh, I guess slicing. Uh, you used a word granularity, um, how, finite are those measurements between each sample size. So. Yeah, I don't think I have like a mathematical way of going about it, but similar to what Kent mentioned, I think I just kind of experiment and see like, I think it was pretty interesting the, the way the author showed that um, if you go down pretty granular, you can start to see some interesting patterns. And um, one thing that I do pretty frequently is I, I utilize the patchwork package Okay. And so you can arrange plots, not like faceted, but it just kind of helps me. And then I can put a title um, on each plot. And if I have four kind of arranged in a single, um, in a single like, you know, plot four subplots, and then I can have a title for bin width equals 0.1 or bin width equals one or bin width equals five. And that helps me to see and also record for future use like okay this is why i chose this particular bin with it wasn't just like yeah. pulling a number out of my head good good um, that's a that's a really good way to to plot multiple instances and then choose which one kind of makes more sense and i, yeah. I made a i made a comment to that if if uh, i'll i'll show it in the exercise down below but i i made a statement similar to that comment of of trying to run this particular code multiple times and selecting the one that that uh, applies or, or shows your story, relates to your story closer. Exactly, yeah. And I'm also just like super neurotic. So if I need to have like everything written down and documented that I can go back to, because a Good week point. from now I'll be like, why did I do this? Yeah. 
good point. Um, I have on here, never rely on defaults. Um, defaults are usually not going to apply uh, in, in, in form of what you're, you're trying to plot. Uh, always adjust your bin or your X limit to zoom in or zoom out of your data. There's no hard or fast rule, only experimentation to discover correlation in the plot. For, it, for your audience or reader, what you're plotting this for, ensure you add a caption of your scale, uh, for example, that bin width, and Stan, you uh, just reinforce that comment, uh, have that measurement on there so they know how you're, you're slicing and dicing. Okay. Three ways to compare a distribution, show small multiples of one histogram. Uh, you can use a facet wrap, uh, which is the uh, approximation of variable. Um, use color and frequency polygon or geom freak poly. Um, or you can use a, a conditional density plot, and that's geo, uh, geome histogram, and then your position is the fill. In this next example, I believe this is where I cut off in the last presentation, we were, again, using the diamonds and using that same aesthetic of depth, but now we're plotting it using a different form or a, a geome. In this case, it's freak poly. Now, the freak poly, the aesthetic we're using is color, and then the measurement of that color correlation is, is cut, the, the uh, style of the cut of the diamond. We're limiting it to a bend width of 0 0.1. And then also uh, there was a reference in the text where it said the diamonds data set has a bunch of NA data in there. Uh, so we want to remove uh, from that particular cut aesthetic. Um, if there was any NA values, uh, just uh, exclude them from the plot. And that's a good a rule of thumb in real world data. Uh, there may be samples where you have NA. So by adding that in there, it just excludes that uh, row from being plotted. Our X limit is still maintained at 58 to 68. Uh, that was the measurement that we used uh, up and above in the previous uh, plot point. And then we're adding a theme legend position is none. So in the theming concept uh, with the legend position selecting is none, it's not gonna uh, uh, anything to the screen or it's not going to uh, print anything to the screen. I like the uh, I like this variable other than the yellow uh, on white uh, for me just doesn't quite stand out uh, strong enough but if I were to scroll up to the very top histogram and then compare it to this next uh, uh, plotted point using the freak poly uh, geome you're you're measuring the cut of the diamond which is going to be your different colors of plot and then the uh, depth is the height, or excuse me, count. Depth is your x coordinates. Count is going to be the uh, quantity of that measurement. Um, I think, I believe, and anybody can stop me if I'm incorrect with this, by calling on the color, it's just iterating through different hex values of that uh, point. Uh, Ryan, in our uh, mastering shiny, we kind of went off on a tangent about that topic. I think it was after after the presentation was over, but um, we were talking about the uh, attribute of color and then the built-in features of that plot point. Go um, down a rabbit hole if you'd like on that subject, but I think it iterates through its different uh, choices. Let me keep going. Sorry, team. Our next point is going to be a different uh, uh, type. And again, it's still the same histogram with the aesthetic of fill equals cut. Uh, previously, we were using the color equals cut. So it's just changing the different colors as it is distributed. Here, by adding the, the aesthetic fill and then uh, equaling to the, to the uh, variable cut, we're going to, to give us a different plotted output um, and then the position is also fill as well. Here, the color output, uh, the reference in the author had stated was, you may have to change some of these in the freak poly uh, output uh, to make sense or in this histogram with uh, the aesthetic itself, you may have to change or modify some of your bin widths uh, and the uh, variables used uh, to make sense of what this output would be. If I scroll up and compare it to the previous, uh, it's not technically inverted, but it's doing the same concept, uh, only now we're filling it with the um, uh, cut measurement instead of uh, doing the uh, uh, your color as cut instead. Comments at all from the team? 
I have a question. So on this one, <clears throat> with the freak poly geome, um, yes. the y-axis is by count. And then when you scroll down and you look at the other one where you go to histogram, it looks like it changes to a percent. Is um, that zero to a hundred percent? Is that that's what, my how you're interpreting it? Yeah, that's my interpretation. So, uh, but I didn't see where that was specified anywhere in the actual code. So it may be that the default stat for histogram is, you know, because the default stat for histogram would still be count, right? Any, it, did this stand out to anybody else or am I missing anything? It doesn't use any stat variable if that's our stat argument, if yeah. that's what you're... Well, uh, with, but there's going to be a default stat and I was thinking that the default stat for histogram would be count. Um, so I think I, it's I, the I, position fill that makes it change. I'm not sure that might be this, position fill. Yeah. This last chunk here, Kent, is what you're referring to. Is that position fill? Yes. Okay. So that might turn it into a percentage rather than a, a number, which I guess makes sense. Well, that's a good comment, Ryan, uh, to, uh, to point that out. Uh, in the previous example, we didn't have that position point, um, where in the second, uh, it almost looks the same. The only thing that's changed is instead of the, uh, well, it's, it, instead of using freak poly, it's using histogram instead. Yeah. But then the, uh, the, uh, instead, it's, it's using fill uh, instead of uh, the color attribute instead. Okay. All right. Uh, I, uh, mm, sorry. I just wanted to say that the, um, the color, and if you can go back there to the Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, this is because use the fill, because it's an Instagram store, it does need to fill the bars. And, and then um, in the uh, freak poly, you use the color because you just have lines, so you have nothing to fill. I see. So if you use color, doesn't doesn't. Uh, if you use fill, doesn't doesn't work on the fill poly. Yeah. The next point that the author is making is you can also plot density using the geom density function. Using density plot uh, when you know that the underlying density is smooth, continuous, and unbounded. So again, this is the diamonds geom with excuse me diamonds data set with the aesthetic of depth. Nothing's changed in that, but instead now we're using a different geome type density. Uh, again, we're excluding the NA equals true, uh, maintaining the same uh, X limits of, of 58 to 68. And because it's a continuous plot, uh, that geome density uh, allows us to uh, plot those uh, points. I believe, or team, please uh, uh, speak up if I uh, am in an error with this thought. If your data is not continuous, this would not work, or the plot that you would get would be all kind of scattered, correct? I think the way the, the density is working is it's each sample point, it's connecting the lines in between each of those samples. Like if we were to scatter plot this, oh, no, no, scatter plot wouldn't work, never mind trying to think of a way that I could measure this uh, using those two points and then connect the dots as we go through it. Yeah, I think you do need a continuous variable on the x-axis and it's, um, it's more subtle than just connecting the dots. It's actually doing a, a um, kernel density estimate, which okay. is a little bit hard to explain without um, some pictures, I think, but it, it, at each point, it looks at, it kind of does a weighted sum at each point where the weights are a nor from a normal curve. And so it's sort of adding up a lot of little normal curves that are weighted by how many points there are at each, at each how many, yeah, how many points there are at each location. Well, and Ken, since you're with us still, uh, that is going to be also the relation that goes into the mapping feature next chapter, correct? Is it, that's how the, the uh, geospatial data is plotted as well. I'm not wanting to jump into the next chapter, but I'm, I'm wanting to make a relation between what we're seeing here in the, 
the lines versus what haps, happens in a, a, a mapping service. I think that that's a bit of an overgeneralization. Okay, sorry. It, it All right. depends on, on the specifics of what you're mapping. If you were doing a density plot, then, then yes. But if you're drawing polygons or points, um, then no. No, I see what you're saying. All right, I'll retract that comment then. Uh, I'll, I'll do some more research on those, those subjects. Moving further down the list, uh, we're going to uh, combine uh, what we had uh, plotted earlier using the, sorry, I keep scrolling up and down. I wanna make sure that I'm speaking correctly. Using the Geome Freak Poly, uh, we're going to combine this together and generate a similar uh, format. Uh, in this case, it's using the Geome Density instead. Um, so we have our aesthetic as depth that isn't changing. Uh, we are adding the fill equals the cut, uh, again, as indicated earlier. And then now we're adding the color as cut as well. So fill and color are identical. Then by using the geome density and making our alpha uh, value 0.2, uh, keeping the same limits of 58 to 68, you can see that we have a completely different plotted output that is a combination of what we were showing previously by itself. Uh, Frederica, you're uh, smiling, so I'm going to assume that there's a thought that you have. Oh, no, no, nothing about the, the thing. Yes, you're right. Absolutely right. Yes. I thought this was a great graph in relation to viewing it in two different points above where we just have the uh, uh, free poly uh, plotting out our, our lines uh, using the uh, fill color in this case, and then finally adding that density plot to it now provides a completely different geome. So it's merging multiple previous topics, separate graphs, combining the arguments together to produce a completely different geome altogether. It is often the case uh, and advisable to sacrifice quality for quantity. The following three graphs, uh, types of graph, provide examples of this thought. So the first one is we're not really worrying about making it color coded or, or kind of looking all pretty. Uh, we just wanted to see the relationship of our, our output. And so we're doing a box plot. And if you recall from the very beginning of this chapter from two weeks ago, uh, box plot uh, provides a line of the plotted point and then the measurements within that particular variable. Um, we're adding both clarity and depth. So that's where you get the box plot and then all of the other uh, points in addition. We're gonna see this uh, again here in a moment with the exercises. Uh, this will come out uh, uh, as one of the questions for uh, I think it was carrot value and price. I think I plotted it out. The second is going to be the violin effect. Excuse me, no, this is increase. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Would you mind scrolling up just a little bit? I wanted to um, look at the, uh, the X axis and the Y yeah. axis together. So. So the aesthetic on this one is clarity and that's captured, okay, on the bottom on the x-axis and then depth on the y-axis of the box plot. So, um, so, it autom so the, the box plot geome automatically creates, um, uses that x aesthetic to make each individual uh, box plot that way. Uh, the clarity uh, variable, the X clarity, that's a uh, discrete value within yeah. our data set. So if you were to group these together in different, um, uh, like brown diamonds, uh, uh, clear yeah. diamonds, you know, you've got some kind of a flaw in there, et cetera. That's what all of these various measurements represent. Um, yeah. I don't recall, it's not in this textbook, uh, way, way, way back a couple of years ago, I remember reading up on the diamonds data set and what those discrete uh, values mean. Yeah. Uh, it is an accurate measurement of the, the diamonds uh, clarity. It's, it's, it's the uh, quality of the diamond. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, going to the next point, we're using the same X and Y coordinates, carrot and depth. Um, again, it's a box plot, but now we're going to add a cut width of carrot of 0.1. And what we see happening here 
is that your measurement of caret is changed. Excuse me. Previously, it was clarity. Uh, forgive me. This one, we're talking about the size of the diamond, the carat, the weight of the diamond, how large it is. And then the uh, depth of the diamond, the height of the diamond, uh, using that same uh, box plot uh, format. What is unique in this example is we're forcing the uh, cut width of the carat of 0.1. So that's your, your measurement. No, that's not the measurement. What is the 0.1? Uh, it's almost like the bin. There you go. It's yes, like the bin that it's similar to the bin that we do, that we use on the histogram. Excellent. Yeah, yep. I kind of thought about it like yeah, binning a, a continuous variable into discrete blocks, exactly like Ryan S said. Good, good, great comment, Ryan. Um, all right, next is going to be the violin. Um, I always find these a little hard to interpret um, because it's a little more. Uh, the, the, con the, the lines that are painted um, are a measurement of the grouping of that uh, uh, particular variable. Um, I'm not an anti-violin person, uh, only I, I, I often don't use these. Um, it's hard for me to explain uh, the representation of what's happening. Um, box plot provides a little clearer example of how to produce it. Violin gets a little funny. Um, anybody have an opinion about the violin geome? Yeah, I uh, I love the violin geomes, yeah. but I I I mean my data sets are usually a bit different. But one thing that we always do in my lab is like plot um, the violin plots, but then the raw data is points on top, and I, I do it that way because you can control I think the jitter more. Whereas I think in the geome box plot, the jitter argument is already handled kind of under the hood. There might be a way that you can change that, but um, I'm also a really big fan of using the the uh, GGB swarm package. Okay. Um, so it allows you to, it's similar to geome jitter, but um, I think whereas the jitter just kind of gives like random motion, the geome B swarm sort of allows you to, or quasi random basically allows you to get um, almost like a density plot and sort of like a density distribution, but still having the individual points. So. I feel like this is a very difficult way of explaining. It, it just looks a little bit cleaner than yeah. uh, the geome jitter. And there's a little bit more, I guess, like um, it's not as random, um, but if you plot like the the geome B swarm on top of the violin plot, I think it helps to interpret um, kind of these like long trailing lines in, in the violin plots. Excellent point. Uh, I've never used B Swarm before. I will check that one out. Uh, and there is a reference uh, with the jitter package, uh, but our jitter argument. Um, I haven't, uh, I didn't deploy it. Um, I've never used it before. And so when it came up in the examples, uh, they only make a reference. They don't show how to actually deploy it. I okay. wasted too much time with uh, creating a plot that wasn't in the book. Um, if anybody would want to share an example of that, Stan, if you have one, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to lob over the controls unless it's sensitive data, then we can cross that bridge. No, it's, uh, it's not sensitive. If you give me a second, yeah. I can um, okay. find it here. Um, Let me take a box plot again, yeah. the clarity box plot. Uh, this first uh, one or the, no, the, the, like one. the very first one we saw, like this one. Okay, so what I, so the way it appears to me, like as far as the violin plot, I think um, like looking at them where it's widest, um, it appears like it would be like the median for each of these. And then the length of it would be like, um, like bas basically it goes to like even the outliers. Cause I'm pretty sure um, v VS2 was also the longest and they're all, they all basically line up where the medians are. And then I guess it adds kind of like a density to it because like within the box plot, you don't really see how dense a particular, um, uh, I guess the density of the particular medium. But I think like, especially for the very first one, it's the I1 where it's a bit thinner on, for the other than the other ones because it's so like, um, like especially from like the interquartile range seems more spread out than the other ones. Like when you look at the violin plot. 
and if I if I scroll back down again, uh, keep this as a mental image in your thought. Uh, scroll back down and then distribute this using the violin. How those two relate with each other? I think you are correct, uh, Lydia. You're 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 uh, explaining it properly. Okay, uh, Stan, yeah. are you good, or do you want me to move on? Yeah, no, I'm I'm good. If you want, I can just yeah. like quickly. Yeah, that's um, okay. I'll just stop on that side uh, for a moment. How do I? Oh, share screen. That would yeah. make sense. Uh, can I just share my finder? Oh, hold on. I guess I didn't allow Zoom to share my screen. Give me one second. Uh, maybe I can just share this in the in the Slack if this is okay. going to be. No worries. Uh, I'll go back to that. Move that back over. Um, normally, and this is a good comment, Stan, uh, Zoom as a feature, when you share, you can either share a given window or an entire screen. And okay. I've, always, I've always found that sharing your screen is simpler, easier. You just have to keep in mind any sensitive data that you may also have open. Um, a lot of users will share a single window, and then you have to continually change your, your, what you're presenting to the user. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a work computer. I think uh, by default, I can't, I can't share anything. I have to like manually go change it. So, and it just said I had to, I would have to quit and restart Zoom. So I'll just yeah. share an example on the Slack channel. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, sir. Um, going back to Lydia's comment, uh, this next example, uh, we're expanding it even further. So again, Diamond's data set, uh, we're using the aesthetic of both X caret and Y as depth. Um, we're using the violin geome, uh, but we're adding another aesthetic on top using the group equals, equals the cut width. And then inside that cut width, uh, the caret is uh, 0.1. Uh, we're measuring the caret and then the 0.1 is the limit. Is that correct? Um, so your, your output is, a, like Stan had mentioned, the bin, uh, very, uh, bin argument. Uh, you're kind of separating or making it uh, a little greater. You're, you're zooming into the data more, but I don't know if zoom is the right term to use. Um, any comments on that statement? I'd say, I think that kind of made sense. It's like you're separating it a bit more what Stan said as far as like making the categorical data more discreet because like I didn't look at the data as far as like what the specific carrots are, but like, it just gives you more information, like per, I guess the 0 0.1 of, yeah, 0 0.1 of each carrot versus yeah. just lumping them all. When, and this is completely not even related to any sort of uh, content here. I'm, I'm kind of going off the cuff, but uh, when I think of certain categorical data or, or separation, this bin type measurement. Um, if you've ever watched uh, Modern Marvels or some engineering show on uh, uh, any of the Discovery History uh, TLC type channels, there is usually a, a vibrating table. And then uh, I always think of it as like the uh, size that the unit, whatever it is that you're separating drops through. Um, and so that's how you get your different uh, uh, sizes. I, it's probably a bad relation and it may not make sense uh, unless I can show somebody what I'm referring to. But as I relate that to some of these geomes and, and comprehending what exactly I'm doing with the separation or the binning of those uh, uh, points, it uh, starts to make sense how the data is uh, uh, plotted. And I'm gonna, again, I keep going to the exercise, but here in a moment, there's a question where we change the variables slightly and then uh, figure out which is the best representation or the, the bin, width, uh, bin width of that measurement and how it relates to each other. So let me keep going here. So now we finally get to the exercises. So uh, what bin width tells you the most interesting story about the distribution of caret? Okay, again, if caret is the measurement, of your, uh, sorry, the size uh, of your diamond. The number of bins or bin width should be an exploration exercise. There is not 
a uh, direct hard or fast rule for scaling of bin width. What is important is to find the appropriate size that best captures the representation or distribution of your analysis. That may sound like I'm just repeating myself, but what I'm attempting to state is that uh, exact, exactly what Stan had mentioned or what Kent had uh, talked about as well. You're just applying a variable and then does it look correct? Uh, if not, uh, maybe change a different bin width and see if there's any more relation that you can pull out of that analysis. Stan, I really enjoyed your statement of, of not faceting, but you're producing a lot of graphs together and then choosing which one makes more sense or view uh, makes more sense. The next one says, draw a histogram of price. Uh, what interesting patterns do you see? Um, I guess it didn't. Oh, I bet you that's a, this is a mistake I made. Um, I had in the R code, the R code snippet, um, it's a, uh, uh, I had an argument of PNG. Uh, so it doesn't look like it's coming through. If the team would give me just a second, let me move this over. And I'll be able to show you what that plot looks like. And this is in the exercises, which are, Here. Okay, so I was making a, a, a note block that actually should have a space there. But when you draw the histogram of price, and I don't think this takes forever, I think the bin width, I was changing this variable quite a bit. Uh, and do I have it in viewer? No. Honest. No. Okay. That out. okay. So really. Uh, probably hard to see what I'm doing, but um, the measurement of care, uh, measurement of carrot is the value we're pointing. And then this count number is the quantity of that uh, size. And then the, the price value, what we were trying to do is find the relationship between the carrot size and the price itself. Um, I found that when I used too small of a bin, uh, as Kent had mentioned, uh, that there was like missing data or it didn't quite um, plot properly. Uh, and then as I was increasing the number, I didn't want to go infinitely large. But uh, the here's an example of some missing data uh, within that particular measurement. It just doesn't exist, so it doesn't plot. But what I was answering this question towards is that you're going to have a huge quantity of diamonds of a small size. And so therefore your count is really high and the price is probably fairly low. But as you increase the size of your diamond, the carat uh, uh, scale of your diamond, it's going to become more costly because obviously those are more expensive in general. And so the histogram plot or, or what we're showing here is just this kind of almost logarithmic type uh, scale out uh, where at the very end, you don't have very many big diamonds, but they're going to cost you a lot of money as well. Makes sense. And I thought if anybody wants to, to uh, add any comments to this uh, assessment, uh, please feel welcome to. Right. So my, my statement here, as I said, the smaller uh, the quant, sorry, the smaller the diamond, the quantity assuming quality, the higher the price. I presume that carat size would also have a strong correlation with quality and price. Um, that's quantity, quantity, the amount that you have in possession, uh, quantity and price. So I was hoping to satisfy my previous comment of as the carrot size increases, uh, you're going to have fewer of that diamond and the price value also goes up considerably in that case as well. Um, let's go back to our presentation. And then the last one is, um, I did not uh, finish the option number four uh, or question number four, exercise number four. It asks to overlay the freak poly uh, and density plot using depth. When computing uh, computed variable, do you, what computed variable do you need to map uh, to a Y coordinate to make the two plots comparable? Uh, you can either modify the geom freak poly or the geom density. Um, at the time of, of me messing with this, I didn't want to spend too much time trying to answer the exercise. I will still go back and attempt to finish it. Um, I just didn't have enough 
thought process at the time. All right. This next topic, I believe either Priyanka or Kent, if I'm stating correctly, we talked about the overplotting uh, uh, problem of too much data and trying to expect that the geome that we're using or re visually representing uh, just doesn't make sense. You don't get any output from it. So the uh, statement is scatterplot is a very important tool for uh, assessing relationships. It's just literally the simplest one to take a single variable, one output, and just scatter plot it and say, does it make sense? Is there anything that I, I have a value here? Um, this is called overplotting when you have this, uh, I always think of a, 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 a bird shot uh, out of a, a shotgun shell. Um, it, there's a really wide spread of the, uh, the uh, points. So we're creating a data frame uh, with a R norm of 2000 and the, the Y, excuse me, X is 2000 and Y is 2000. Uh, norm is, uh, we're creating a plot with the aesthetics of X and Y that we created above. Uh, and then our labels are both null. Uh, when you plot that norm using geo point, uh, we get this kind of scattering, but there isn't really anything of value here. Uh, when I initially looked at this, um, it is a scatter plot. However, if we start to change things, so here we're adding a geom point uh, and then the shape value of one, you start to see that uh, where is the grouping of these plotted points. In the previous example, if I were to scroll back up, it just looks like everything overlays each other. But by making them hollow, now you can start to see where these groups start to come together. It makes a little more sense. And then the third example is if we were to uh, decrease our size. And Frederica, Kent, Stan, anybody is welcome to comment. I don't understand what the point means uh, or the, the period in this quotation mark. Does anybody want to add their thoughts there? I know it has to do with the pixel size, but I don't, I, I'm not understanding what the period in this shape value represents in, in this particular plot, other than it showed smaller. So I'll, I'll, as far as I understand, all the different shapes that can be used on here have an assigned name. Okay. Um, so the name of this particular shape is just the, the period symbol. So where you up, up above where you have yeah. shape equals one, that's a reference to hollow circles. I see. And um, I don't, I, I think they're all, I'm sure they're all listed out somewhere, but like, you know, shape number five might be a star and shape 12 might be you know, rainbows or something like that. Understood. Okay. I yeah, know what you're I just referring looked to. it up. Uh, it looks like shape 96 corresponds to the pixel, the little dot. So I guess I, I'm curious if you were to put shape equals 96 instead of the the character equivalent, if that would work. Let's uh, let's give that a shot um, just for... Yeah, I think it has both names. Learning. I think some of them have, have actual names, alias yeah. names. I wouldn't put it in quotation marks though. Yeah, I think it's just the, uh, the numeric. So we have our first plot, second plot. And Look at that. The, there you go. Pop that out. I don't know, are these stacked next to each other? No, because I'm highlighting it. So yeah, did it just, oh, that is really small. I bet any, you probably don't notice it on the screen. Uh, those yeah no that's pretty hard to see points are very 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 small um, no, they're they're the size of a pixel <laughs> there yep yep exactly all right uh, good point Stan thanks for uh, trying that out um, right. uh, alternative ways of using large data sets you can use an alpha blending mechanism or transparency of your uh, data points. If you specify alpha as a ratio, the denominator gives the number of points that must be overplotted to give a solid color. So what you're seeing here is the alpha variable and then this uh, numerator and denominator relationship. So one over three uh, gives us a little bit of a, a grayscale uh, to our plot. 
Uh, and then again, you can see how each of the plotted points overlap each other. If I put it as one fifth, uh, it starts to, to fade out even more. And then at the very bottom, we use one tenth. So if you stop and stare at this for just a brief moment and comprehend exactly what the ratio of, of numerator and denominator relationship is doing, um, as the plotted points stack on top of each other, you're going to get a, a stronger density uh, or what would be the stroke value. Uh, you're getting a, a, a deeper um, gray color as all of the plots uh, or all of the points stack on top of each other. Um, it may or may not be helpful. It's all dependent on the data set that you're trying to visualize. So moving on. Um, Stan, this is the first time that the geo jitter was called out in our textbook. Um, I did not plot this, but it was it was a third way that uh, the author was uh, expressing how to plot your points. Uh, geo jitter can be used uh, if your data has some discreteness. By default, 40% is used, uh, and then you can override the default with both width and height arguments. I did not have an example for this. I didn't, I didn't try to produce one on my own. The last section is alternatively, we can think of overplotting as a 2D density uh, estimation of a problem, which gives a, a rise to two more approaches. We, have our, uh, we can bin the points and count the number in each bin, then visualize the count, the 2D generalization of the histogram or geome bin 2D. So this is a completely new uh, geome that we're expressing in this case. Uh, and so now you get kind of almost like this pixelated uh, sort of output, uh, the color relation or the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, how light or dark that particular color is doing is in relation to the count of Gradient. variable. Gradient. Gradient, thank you. Yes, that's correct, Lydia, thank you. That's a great uh, uh, statement for that. So your, your density of each of these uh, scatter plot points is using a different geome, but the uh, gradient, as Lydia had mentioned, is going to represent um, how many counts are within that scatter. Okay. If we increase our bin to 10, um, it's doing the same attribute, only now we're, we're grouping things together. Um, so it doesn't look as pixelated. And so it looks at the very center here, uh, we have 150 as we expand out into other areas, kind of a heat map sort of look, um, the count decreases. All right, this last one is using a different package altogether. Uh, this one's called hex bin, uh, so geome hex. And here it's the same exact data set that we're applying team, uh, that norm that we created above. Uh, but it's just using a different plot. And Frederica, I had you in mind uh, with this relation in Tidy Tuesday. I believe one of your uh, submissions for that Tidy Tuesday, um, you had used some type of image. I don't recall how that was applied, um, but it was, a, it was an image and then you, you painted the importance of each one, kind of a heat map uh, within that single image. I'd be interested to see how that code snippet would look. Uh, I don't think it's as simple as just geome hex. Uh, I think there's a way to plot that within the boundaries of a, of a uh, black and white uh, image. But Yeah, I don't know which one do you refer to because I did some, uh, but uh, um, the, the geome hex is quite easy. Uh, so you, 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 you can just apply this and then it, it's the data that are very important. So if you set the data, if you set the data ready for the geome, you can uh, uh, use just the geom easily without making any. So the, 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 the main point is the pre-processing thing. So like setting up the data ready for the geom. But um, what I've done nicely, I think it's uh, got quite popular was the, the thing for the um, uh, Olympics. And okay. but there, I haven't used that. I've used st uh, the stroke thing. Okay. So ju just uh, um, very, uh, the sh uh, one of the shapes uh, that you put inside uh, a geom point. And okay. you can, yeah, it's an option. 
like size, like uh, um, there is this option that is, I don't know if you did it because, but um, it's stroke and you can set the stroke uh, to a certain number. So you have like a ring and inside you put the things that you want. Yes. But, um, so your, your measurement of value would be the stroke itself, correct? The, yeah. When uh, for the rest of the team in in uh, visualizing vector graphics, stroke is the weight of the line. So if you add that as a variable, your vector graphic output would represent the uh, not scale. What's the stroke is uh, is the is the weight of the line. Uh, so if you if you want to increase the amount of stroke you have, then you know you have this really. Uh, big thick line. If it's of a smaller value, then it would be a really thin line. So stroke is kind of the the density or how 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 big of a line you're you're producing. So if you were to tie that stroke with the data set itself, then you could potentially output a uh, a uh, series uh, representing. Scrolling down to the bottom uh, again, this is the same plotted. Uh, output team using that uh, geom hex uh, and then the bins are 10. So it's just changing the, the size. Uh, uh, your bin is obviously the grouping or the, or the scale. Um, how big of groups are you putting these together as? Another approach to dealing with overplotting is to add data summaries to help guide the eye to the true shape of the pattern within the data. Um, that's not my words. I took that directly out of the text. I found it important to convey um, by changing or adding data summaries to it, um, similar to what Stan had mentioned with uh, not fastening, but the uh, bee swarm uh, with the violin plot, um, giving some level of summary to what that graph is doing or what is important about it. Now, this particular chapter, chapter of statistical summaries just repeats itself. I don't, the, the title of this chapter five is statistical summaries. So I felt that the, uh, the heading level, um, not sure if that was by purpose that they were named the same or not, but what we're doing is combining material together in this very, very last section. With this paragraph, I did not alter it or try to summarize it. I copied and pasted it directly because it was actually a really formal uh, paragraph uh, within this text. So it's talking the geohistogram and geobin 2D use familiar geomes, uh, both geom bar and geom raster, combined with a new statistical transformation, which is stat bin and stat bin 2D. Stat bin and stat bin 2D combine the data into bins and count the number of observations in each bin. But what if we want a summary other than the count of those values? So far, we've just used the default statistical transformation associated with each geome. Now we're going to explore how to use stat summary bin uh, to stat summary 2D to compute different summaries. Again, that sounded confusing, but what I found important with that is the relationship of how these different geomes work together with each other. As we start to do this bin 2D and summary 2D, it's setting us up for this next chapter uh, five of mapping with geospatial data. Uh, and I know I'm wetting our palette for that next topic, but I found that this last section of chapter five is in strong relation to what we're going to be talking about in this next section or next chapter. Uh, Geoplot uh, diamonds, ggplot diamonds, uh, aesthetic is going to be color, and then we're just doing a geom bar. What we find is that we have a common histogram, but the bins aren't really that great. Uh, it doesn't really separate too much. Showing it as a secondary, where we add the stat argument of summary bin, and then the fun value equals, uh, fun is actual function, correct? Fun is not having fun. It's, it's, I think that's short for function. Function is the mean that we're plotting. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so by, Using the aesthetic of color and price, um, we get a different uh, plotted output. Right. Here we're using a bin 2D, our geom bin 2D, uh, bin width equals one. Uh, limits uh, for both Y and X coordinate systems are 50 and 70, respectfully. Um, this is just scaling so that we have all of our data plotted within one point. 
um, if you were not to set those limits, um, the output may not represent what we're, what we're uh, uh, going after. So we witnessed the use of this uh, pixelated form uh, previously in our, our other examples. Um, and then this is going, this one didn't run. This Ryan, real quick, I just wanted to point out the time. Oh, is it time? Yeah, so our time. Okay. Yeah, we've gotten to the end of the hour, but um, I'm sure we can pick up the rest of this. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to start with next week uh, finishing chapter five, Ryan. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to show you these last two examples, and then we'll call it a day, if that's all right. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, and I guess anybody should feel free to drop off if they need to. Yeah, forgive well. me. Go for it. All you. Okay, these last two points, what the author is trying to convey is that we're plotting three-dimensional data on a 2D scale. Uh, and so the, the point of this next plot, and again, it's setting us up for the mapping feature, uh, we're using the old faithful uh, data set, and then the eruptions and then weighting uh, is our X and Y coordinate system. So what we're doing is, is almost using this geom contour uh, to give us a, a depth scale. Uh, and I found that this is kind of like when you plot elevation on a 2D map, um, the height of a mountain or height of a hill off of a, a two dimensional scale, you always see the, the contour lines that uh, stack up and give you kind of a, uh, a height off of the map itself. Same goes if we were to use a raster image of the same output, um, identical, identical services, um, everything is this blue background, but then you notice the two contour points uh, change in the gradient. Uh, Lydia, thank you for that word. Uh, we change the gradient of the color so that it shows kind of a, 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 a different depth scale to those uh, uh, points. Again, comparing the two bottom right, uh, yeah, bottom left corner, top right corner, um, that gradient level is representing those two points. That's all I've got, Ryan. I'm all finished. That's the last uh, output. Oh, I'm sorry, one more graph, bubble plots. Um, the bubble plot does the same output. We just see the grouping at the bottom left and the top right. Uh, but again, providing a scale of measurement to the uh, uh, eruptions. So. Cool. Okay, so you're, you're good then, Ryan? So you'll pick up, uh, you said chapter six next week as well? Chap chapter cool. six is what we're gonna work on next week and that's all mapping features. Um, awesome. I didn't see that Gustavo was in here and I'm hoping Kent will be here next week as well. Um, I think both users also expressed a lot of detail about mapping in, yeah. in general, so. Cool, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, definitely. All right, awesome. take it easy everybody. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Right. Bye -bye. See you next week. <laughs>